Listen to him. But woe unto you that are rich, for ye have received your consolation. Now, we find that the false prophet, he's patronized by the world. And if he'll say the right thing, they'll pay him well. But the Lord Jesus makes it very clear he needn't expect God to pay him. He may become popular with the world, but he'll be notorious with God. He may have fun here, but he'll cause heaven to weep. He may be well fed, but he's got a starved soul. And very little is said today, as our Lord did, about the godless rich. A great deal is said about that in Scripture. And I want you to notice what he says here. But woe unto you that are rich. And verse 25, Woe unto you that are full, for ye shall be hungry. Woe unto you that laugh now, for ye shall mourn and weep. Woe unto you, and all men shall speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. But I say unto you which hear, love your enemies, do good to them that hate you, bless them that curse you, and pray for them that despitefully use you. Now, very little, as we've said, is made of the godless rich today. The underworld is always used as an example of godlessness. You've got to go down and get that poor criminal that stole $25, or he stole a suit of clothes, or he picked up a $50 ring somewhere. It seems to be that the godless rich are far more dangerous than the godless poor. You see, they give a glamour to godlessness. And I feel today there's more hypocrisy among the rich than there are among any group. They'll pay a false prophet in their church, and they own the church and they'll own the prophet. No rich church today has the reputation of being an evangelical church. They'll not have a man who preaches the gospel. There may be a few exceptions to this, but I don't know them. I've never heard of. They'll not have a man who preaches the gospel in New York City. There is a church that's called by the name of a rich man. And they've never had a gospel preacher there because he won't have a gospel preacher there. A gospel preacher would condemn him. And James has a great deal to say, Go to now, ye rich man. I wonder when a great many Christians in this country are going to wake up to the fact that these rich politicians today are throwing crumbs from their table down to the poor today. They're not interested in the poor. They're not interested in the question of civil rights either. They want to be able to keep their riches and enjoy them in selfishness, and they're willing to give a few crumbs to the poor. The very interesting thing is that in civil rights, you will notice that they're not interested in having different colored folk live in their community. <laughs> they know they're not able to. They want them to live in your community and mine. And by the way, I don't mind if they do. <laughs> I'm more concerned not about the color of the skin, but the color of the heart. Has a man's heart been washed in the blood of Christ? And if he has, he's my brother. I'm going to be living with him for eternity, and I just better start learning to live with him now. His heart may be as black as ink and his skin white as snow, and he's not my brother. I'm sorry to have to say that, friends, but he's not my brother. Somebody says, well, what you're saying sounds revolutionary. Sure is. That's what Jesus said, friends. There are those today that tell me they're following Jesus. They don't dare follow him. If they did, they'd be in trouble. You read what he has to say here, and believe me, my friend, it will take the cloak of hypocrisy and peel off the skin today of any man. The hypocrisy of those who say they live by the Sermon on the Mount. How about the Sermon on the Plain? Try it on for size and find out. The minister of the church seeking popularity today dares not mention sin. Some use the gyration of psychoanalysis to explain away the exceeding sinfulness of sin. It's called a relic of a theological jungle. It's not a crime against God. Today, they're afraid to say God hates sin. Jehovah's a man of war. And 
you can't just compliment the ego and pat the pride and smile upon sin and put cold cream on the cancer of sin today. You can't write the prescription and philosophy today and have it filled in the pleasures of the world. The only place you can go is to the foot of the cross. He's not giving you a massage when you come to Jesus, my friend, that'll tickle your funny bone. He performs an operation and makes you a new creature in Christ Jesus. That's the message that you have here in the so-called sermon on the plain. It goes along with the Sermon on the Mount. And he gave this message many, many times. But have you noticed that this that I'm giving today isn't very popular? And he concluded it by giving that that you find in the Sermon on the Mount, the parable of the house built on the rock. The house that was built on the rock, it stood. The house that was built on the sand, it was absolutely washed away, but the house on the rock stood. Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I'll show you to whom he's like. He's like a man which built a house, dig deep, laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood rose, the stream beat vehemently upon the house, could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. But he that heareth doeth not is like a man without a foundation, built a house upon the earth, against which the stream did beat vehemently, and immediately it fell. The ruin of that house was great. Now, will you hear me very carefully? I'll tell you what this does for me as I read this particular passage here. It reveals to me that I'm a sinner before God, and it takes off the skin. And that today is the thing that the mob is afraid of today. The Lord Jesus in giving this reveals to me that I'm a sinner and that I need a Savior. And there is a rock, though, on which I can build, and that rock is Christ. Paul said, No other foundation can any man lay than that which is laid, and that is Jesus Christ. 